author and columnist Rodney A. Brooks, who's written his latest book, The Rise and Fall of Freedman's Savings Bank and its Lasting Socioeconomic Impact on Black America. Rodney, welcome to Let's Talk. Well, thank you for having me, Denise. I'm uh, glad to be back. Well, you know, it's always you're you're a prolific writer, and you're always writing about things that we need to to learn about, and always dealing with finance and money and uh, legacy and institutional. What am I trying to say? Uh, yeah, legacy wealth. You know, how do we grow wealth, but also understanding how we are, how we got where we are. So, tell me, how did you decide to write about Friedman Savings Bank, and and what is it? What is the story that you're trying to get folks to know? Well, you know, the Freedman Savings Bank is sort of a lost um, part of Black history because so many people don't know about it. But uh, it's, it was basically a bank that was created by uh, uh, Congress and signed into law by Abraham Lincoln um, as a way for the freed slaves to have somewhere to put their money. Um, but um, probably more importantly, the Black Civil War veterans who were getting wages, from many of them for the first time, had no way, nowhere to save money or to send money home to their families. So, so it was created um, in uh, 1865 and, and it grew quickly. Um, and um, in, for a bunch of reasons, um, you know, including corruption um, on the part of the uh, of the white administrators. Um, the bank failed like nine years later, and with it went the hopes and dreams of of, of many former slaves and, and Black Americans at a time when um, they did not have much money. You know, I, um, as I told you <clears throat> before we got on the show, uh, Washington Former Charities did our annual African-American Heritage Tour not too long ago to Tudor Place. And that story was shared with us. And it was really sort of devastating to think, and maybe if you can put that in some perspective, I mean, these were freed uh, enslaved people who, um, like you said, who put their money into this bank? I mean, what are we talking about? What kinds of what kinds of savings were they putting there, and what what did they hope would happen uh, with that money as they, you know, sought new places to live, you know, relocating, what have you? Tell us about those stories. Well, you know, it's it's unbelievable the amount of records that they have. <laughs> Uh, and I went to the National Archives and, and College Park. They actually have hundreds and hundreds of the original passbooks from these from these people. And um, it was uh, it was savings of you know two three dollars for many. Um, you know some sometimes it was more, maybe a hundred. But um, some of it was children. You had uh, you had organizations. You had churches. But this was the first time that they had a opportunity to put money in the bank and learn, you know, the goal was to not only provide a safe way for them to save money, but also to teach them financial literacy. So when it failed, we lost all of that. Uh, and uh, so, so yeah, the meager wages they had, but but um, when I talk about the Civil War veterans, um, they were actually getting wages and and pensions that were were that were deposited at the, at the bank, and mm -hmm. um, for many of them, um, for many of the people, uh, it was their life savings. Um, you know, and, and over the course of the nine years. Um, it may not have sounded like a lot, but it was a lot for them. I mean, it was money they were going to use to buy farm equipment, to buy homes, to provide educations for their children. Uh, and uh, and many of them lost it when the bank failed. Where so, was this bank located? I mean, where uh, was it there actually? Were actually? Yeah, the main branch was uh, um, in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, the the, the, bread, the uh, building is gone, but it's... Um, in its place uh, is the uh, Treasury Annex, which was renamed the Freedom Freedman's Bank Building, and that's on uh, Madison uh, Madison Avenue Northwest. Um, but that was the uh, headquarters. But there are actually thirty seven branches uh, mm. throughout the South and Southwest. I mean, it was like the first <laughs> national bank, uh, and 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 there were in cities like New York and Philadelphia and Washington and Baltimore, but mostly in yeah southern cities. Um, 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 and Southwest, a lot in Texas, um, uh, Tennessee, uh, South Carolina, but many places where they had uh, 
had the military bases where the black soldiers were serving. So the, this bank was managed, really controlled by uh, not black folks, but white folks. That's correct. Right? Uh, who were using, yes. who ended up, I mean, at some point, didn't they bring Frederick Douglass in to try to save the bank? They did. It was, it was when it was originally created, it was created by abolitionists. Okay. Mm -hmm. Eventually, over time, it, it got into the hands of, of white uh, businessmen. Um, and um, they did, uh, well, you know, for, for there was, because there were so many branches, okay, the bank was underfunded. They could not communicate. And, and many of the people who were hired in those branches, um, many of, you know, the white tellers, uh, um, they, uh, there was some corruption. Um, there was incompetence. And um, towards the end, when it got into the hands of the white um, businessmen, that, that was the corruption. I mean, they basically made loans to their own companies and, and, made, uh, and made loans to their friends when, when the bank wasn't supposed to make loans at all. In fact, Black people couldn't get loans from this bank, okay? <laughs> uh, and you were using the, the savings of, of these poor Black Americans to finance loans to white businesses. Uh, so there, were, there was all kinds of things like that going on. So towards the end, um, um, the, you know, it was getting where it was getting around, the bank was failing. They brought in Frederick Douglass, uh, who came in and deposited $10,000 of his own money. Um, and um, when he looked at the books, he, was, he saw that there was no hope, <laughs> that it was, it yeah. was too far gone. <laughs> And and when when the bank failed, uh, which was in 1874, uh, which is just nine years after it started, uh, the depositors lost three million dollars mm. in in 1874. That's about 68 million dollars in today's in today's uh, funds. So there was a huge impact. So so one one of, you asked me why one of the reasons why I wrote the book. One of the reasons was you know we talk about what caused the racial wealth gap, and we talk about all these things like you know like the Tulsa and uh, what happened in Tulsa and where they burned down vibrant business communities. Um, what we don't talk about is we actually had a bank which people thought was a, a, a black bank um, uh, that was overseen by Congress, but but basically nobody, there was no oversight. And and it failed and and with it went the hopes and the dreams of, of countless uh, former slaves and, and Civil War veterans. You know, we can always point to things, um, Rodney, that really shows where we attempted uh, to play by the rules, and then the rug is pulled from under us, and we are end up, you know, taking one step forward and five backwards. It's it's just, uh, and it's no not our no fault of our own often. Um, and then I wonder, you know, the repercussions of that. I mean, you know, because there's still a lot of folks that don't believe in putting their money in banks. Um, do you think that historical legacy is one of the things that contributes to that uh, insecurity about uh, financial institutions? And what would you tell people um, about you know, what they need to be prepared for based on the history or legacy of this story? Well, well yes. Um, there actually have been studies that actually trace the roots, some of the roots of, of our distrust of the financial systems um, to to this bank failure. Um, and so, yes, it, I, you know, still 150 years later, this is still looked at as, as one of the reasons that we distrust uh, um, the, uh, the uh, black, the, the uh, white financial institutions. That, and, and I kind of liken it to the Tuskegee study and why we don't trust uh, <laughs> sure. healthcare institutions because it has that same impact um, that, that this, this trust, you know, passed on generations and generations, and we still have it, and it's still contributing to our lack of trust in these institutions, which is having an impact on our on our financial health and our financial wealth and our generational wealth. So, so what I would tell what I would tell people is, uh, you know, we have to well, for one thing, we have to start 
figuring out um, how how to how to save and invest. We have to do a better job with that. Um, so so you know there are reasons for this distrust, but but we have to find a way to to do that, and we have to do a better job of, of preparing our children um, financially um, with financial literacy. And and I don't want to say financial literacy is going to help get us out of, uh, is, is going to help solve the racial wealth gap because because that's sort of blaming us for 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 the for the issue. But uh, you know it it does help when you teach your children and, and and pass on generational knowledge, but it also helps to pass on generational wealth. So so home purchases, that's one way to do it. Um, and um, and and so many black people die without a will and a state plan. And that's yeah. another so yeah. So. Well, I want to thank you very much for bringing this to us uh, and for writing this book. It's a story that, you know, we need to know about. And, uh, and like I said, it has a lot of its roots right here in uh, the nation's capital. And so I'm really excited. You are always on top of things when it comes to uh, learning about, you know, the socioeconomic impact, financial impact of uh, on our communities, um, so um, a public policy in our communities and other things that happen. So I appreciate you uh, sharing that with us. Do you have anything else you're working on right now what, that we can prepare for? <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if I have another uh, book <laughs> another uh, another uh, book in me, but um, I'm I'm looking at I'm thinking about uh, a you know uh, there's there's all these retirement guides out there, uh, uh, so I'm thinking about a a retirement guide for Black Americans. And you know how how these retirement guides have um, the best city to retire in, and and they're in places where Black people would never go, <laughs> right? Um, so so um, I'm looking at um, I'm looking at uh, maybe doing something um, that would offer advice because we have unique problems as a people, and oh, so. Yeah. So 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 our so the advice for retirement is going to be different from it would be, and it's timely because you know every day I, I'm I'm finding another friend that's uh that's already crossed over and and said okay I'm retired even yes. though they're not retired but the point is you know we have to redefine what that term means today because it's not that's what right. it used to mean yes. uh, even for uh, Black America so. Anyway, looking forward to reading that one as well as the one you just, um, uh, the book you just shared with us. We have posted, posted where people can get a copy and uh, to purchase the book at, uh, um, what is that, Spiramus? It's for Ramis, it's for Ramis for Press, Ramis. Uh, but it's also available on uh, Amazon and uh, BarnesandNoble.com. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Okay. Always glad to you. have you. Okay. All righty. Appreciate and the best to to your wife, Sheila. Thank you so much. All righty, take care.